Amen. All right, so in Genesis chapter 15, let's go ahead and look at verse number 1. If you remember from chapter 14, chapter 14, of course, is when... Um, Lot got taken captive when the, the five kings against the four kings, they came and the, 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 the four kings came and defeated Sodom and Gomorrah and all those kings. And they took Lot and all these other people away captive. So Abram took his hired servants and the people that were confederate with him and they went after those kings and they defeated them and he brought Lot back and he brought all the, their substance back and, and it was a great victory that God had wrought through Abram um, to be able to do to, against all odds against four kings be able to recover Lot and, and those captives back the things that that five kings weren't able to defend themselves against Abram and his and his small group small army a small group of people were able to go and win this great battle and I think this is real interesting because we always have to keep in mind that originally the Bible wasn't divided up into chapters now there's nothing wrong with it being divided in chapters but we just have to remember as we continue to read especially when we go a week apart and a week apart from each other that this is really just a continuation that's why it says in verse 1 after these things after what things after Abram got back from from defeating those people and in this in this battle is over he says after these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying fear not Abram I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward and I, it's a little bit amusing to me that that he gets this word of the Lord after that great battle, he says, I'm your shield. He's like, I was thinking, you know, you could have told me that before, <laughs> before I went out after these people. No, now, obviously, we believe Abram knew this already because he had the faith to go and do this. He had the odds stacked against him, but we see the comfort kind of coming after he already did that great battle. But it's still a great battle, or it's still a great comfort nonetheless. Now, knowing that God's our shield, we see this in... in um, in the, in the Bible, all throughout the Bible, God is the one who, who uh, fights our battles for us. God's the one who wins the great victories in our lives, whether they be physical or spiritual. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. So if you put your faith in Christ, if you put your faith in God, He's going to be your shield. He will be your defense. He is that rock that you can trust in no matter what you're going through, no matter what your trials are, no matter what your struggles are. God will be your shield and your protection. Um, Psalm 144 verse 1 says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield. And he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. And, um, you know, we, all throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms, we see this, these um, reassuring words that we can keep our faith in, in God and he'll be our defense, he'll be our shield, he's our deliverer, and he's going to see us through all of our troubles. Now, let's keep reading here. Verse number two says, and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? See, God said he's also his exceeding great reward. So, God, so Abram answers and says, okay, God, you know, what are you going to give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. So he's basically saying, you know, I don't have any children. And this, this steward, this, this man that's, that's my servant, is basically going to be my heir. Because I don't have anyone, any child of my own. To, to, be, to get the inheritance of mine. And he says in verse 3, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Abram's really looking to have a child. At this point, he's already very old. Um, but God has already promised him that he was going to bless him. And look at, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So God reassures him and he promises him here. He says, look, you will have a son. You will have a child. And this person, this servant, is not going to be your heir, but you will have someone out of your own bowels. Verse number five, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Now that word tell just means to count, right? When you go to a bank, you have a bank teller, they count the money that you've received. So he says, he's basically saying, look, Count the stars, if thou shalt be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So this is a pretty amazing blessing, a pretty amazing promise that God's giving Abram. He's saying, you know, Abram's is looking to have a child. He's looking to have an heir. And God says, look up at heaven. Look at all the stars. Now, 
when you look up to heaven these days, if you're in a big city, you're not going to see that many stars. So he's not, God's not promising to Abram he's going to have like five children. If you live in the big cities in Phoenix or in LA or these other places, you could look like you could count on one hand how many stars you could see. But when you go out to the country, you go out like we're in Prescott Valley, you look at the stars tonight, as long as there's no clouds out there, you will see a whole sky full of stars. And he says, look, if you could even count those, you know, that's how your seed's going to be. A tremendous blessing from God. And um, of course, God keeps his word and, and he did with Abram. But let's keep reading here. So, so that's the promise he makes unto Abram. And look at verse number six. And this is where I'm going to be kind of focusing the, major, the vast majority of the sermon on tonight. Verse number six, it says, And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is a very important verse because this is referred back to, there's three other places in the New Testament that refer back to this verse about Abraham believing God and that belief being counted unto him for righteousness. Those uh, three places are in Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, and in James chapter 2. And we're going to cover quite a bit of ground tonight because James chapter 2 is, is, a, is a section of scripture that a lot of Christians might have a hard time with um, as a troublesome passage, maybe. It's a, it's a passage that the, um, the Mormons and, and just a lot of other um, naysayers, a lot of people who don't believe in salvation by grace through faith will turn to and they'll try to use that as a proof text that no, you have to do works. You know, if, you, if you don't do the works, you're not saved. So we're going to go through these because... Here's the thing, and, and this is always important to understand. When you are reading, especially in the New Testament, when you're reading the New Testament and it quotes the Old Testament, go back and read where you're going from. Look, at, look up those quotes. Look up what it's referring to to help you understand what they're even talking about. right? Because what a lot of people like to do is, is, is rip verses out of context and try to use that to support false doctrine. Yeah. Let's start by looking at Romans chapter 4. Real briefly, we're gonna we're gonna look we're gonna we're gonna quickly go through some of these references to where Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Now Romans four is a great passage. I like using this out soul winning. Um, it's very clear about about salvation being by grace through faith. And this, ref this is the first place we're going to see it refers back to this event of Abraham believing God. And what did he believe? God says, I'm going to multiply your seed. You're gonna, your seed is going to be like the stars of heaven. That was the promise, and that's what Abraham believed. He believed God. He believed in the Lord. He says, you know what? God said it. I believe it. And that's counted to him for righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 1. And um, keep your finger. Put it, put it, if you've got a bookmark or a bulletin or something like that, we're going to end up going back and forth, especially between Romans 4 and James chapter 2, because it's really important to get these two passages side by side and get them both in context to understand what they're both talking about. But let's start reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? So we'll bring up Abraham. Verse number 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Right. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Exactly what we read in Genesis chapter 15. Verse number 4. He explains this a little bit further. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So he's saying, look, when you do works, when you're, when you're, when you're out at work, the reward that you, that you receive, what you receive as a result of that works, that's not grace. That's debt because debt is something that's owed to you. Yeah. So when I go to work and, and I work for my boss, I have, I have a secular job, I put in you know, 40 hours a week or whatever, I do my work for him, the, the paycheck that I receive, that's not grace. Grace is something that you receive that's just undeserved. Grace is receiving just a gift. It's a present. So my boss doesn't say, hey, Dave, you know, you did a great job working. I just want to give you this gift. That's not a gift. I earned it. He owes me my paycheck after I put my hours in and I work for him and I produce for him. Hey, he owes that. That's, that's of debt that he gives that to me. And this is what he's just trying to explain real simply that, look, if you're doing works, that reward is not, it's not reckoned of grace, but of debt because it's owed to you. But look at verse number five. But to him that worketh not... So someone does no good works. They're not doing any works. 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And this is one of the reasons I love, I love going to this chapter because it, it flat out says, look, you have a person who's doing no works, someone, but he that worketh not. That means they're not doing works, but he believes. He put his faith in Christ. He put his faith in God. But that believeth um, on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. God looks at that. He sees that faith and it says, you're righteous because you're believing. Look at verse number six. He goes on. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin period not as long as you keep doing the works or as long as you're obeying and abiding and doing all this other stuff no your sins are covered when you put your faith in god when you put your faith in the lord jesus christ your sins are covered covered and you are forgiven past present future sins are all gone you are forgiven forever and i also like showing this this passage too to people who think that people were saved differently in the old testament because look was abraham saved by a circumcision was abraham saved by doing you know animal sacrifices no. or you could say no well he was before moses you know that came with the mosaic law okay what about david because david came after moses david was living in the time of the mosaic law and the priests and the levites right so people say oh no but they had to do these blood sacrifices and these animal sacrifices and that's how they were saved that's how they received their eternal salvation no it's not even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Your sins are forgiven and covered through the blood of Jesus Christ. They knew that the Messiah was coming and they put their faith in him. Verse number nine, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also." It's kind of a lot of words, but what he's saying there is just, look, circumcision doesn't save you. Keeping those commandments don't save you. You know, Abraham was, was it received righteousness when he believed God. He wasn't even circumcised yet, yet he was righteous. And he says, look, he's the father of all that believe and that they also will be um, blessed with uh, faithful Abraham. We're going to see that in Galatians chapter 3. But he says, uh, verse number 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That promise, the, um, um, our salvation, the promise of our salvation comes through, not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. He says, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, and um, on and on. Let's go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 3. Because this is the, the, the next place we're going to see this reference to Abraham being justified by his faith and not by his works. Now, you saw in Romans 4 there are a lot of very clear, very clear statements regarding our righteousness that's through faith. He spells out, you know, to, to him that worketh not. And David uh, describes the blessedness of the man unto whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. And over and over again, I mean, we see that same theme coming up time and time again. It's not works. Our righteousness comes from our faith. Look at Galatians 3, another very great passage on, on faith alone. The whole, entire book of Galatians, for that matter. Let's start reading in... Um, in verse number one, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the, the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Look at this, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, I can't help but, but just bring this up because Marching to Zion is coming out and it covers this completely. But this is saying specifically, you know those promises that were made unto Abraham and to his seed? It says very specifically in this chapter, it's not to seeds as of many, but as to one and of Christ. And he says here, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a child of Abraham today. The way that God looks at it. Now, God doesn't look at it as saying, oh, well, if you're physically descended from Abraham, you're a child of Abraham and, and heir of his blessings. No, he makes it very clear here in Galatians 3 that they which are of faith, are the children of Abraham. That's why Jesus Christ himself even said, look, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you do not the deeds of Abraham. He says, you do the deeds of your father, the devil. He's saying, look, if you, were a, if you truly were a son of Abraham, you would do the works that Abraham did. He said, but you don't do these things. Jesus recognized the fact that, yes, physically they may have descended from Abraham. Physically, that's where they came from. But he's saying, look, you need to have faith because you're of your father, the devil. You are not truly, in God's eyes, a child of Abraham because you don't do the works of Abraham. You don't have the faith of Abraham. But we who do have the faith are the children of Abraham. Keep reading. Verse number 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. Again, how are people saved in the Old Testament? Well, Abraham was preached the gospel. See, I thought the gospel was just the New Testament. Nope. Amen. Abraham was preached the gospel. Amen saying, In thee all nations shall be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. It explains, just like Romans 40, look, if the, the law is there to show us that we're sinners. And Romans explains the same thing. Look, the law is there as our schoolmaster for us to realize we're not perfect. We don't measure up. We're not as good as we think we are. The law brings a curse. He's saying, you know, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. So if you don't follow the law 100% completely in every little thing, then you're cursed. There's a curse associated with that. This is why we need a Savior to begin with. Salvation has not come by the work through the works of the law in any way, shape, or form. If it came by our works, then it's no longer grace. If it be grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, work is no longer works. And um, if it be grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And that is a tongue twister. That is the hardest thing to, to get out in a... Um, <laughs> under pressure, but that's in Romans 9, I believe. But let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And we could continue going on. Verse 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God and Christ, uh, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul yep. that it should make the promise of none effect. Um, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And now, now let's, go, let's flip over to James chapter 2. And keep your finger in, in Romans 4, because we are going to go back to that, just as we kind of compare these, these scriptures. Now, I wanted to read quite a bit of those passages in Romans 4 and Galatians 3, just to, to lay the groundwork of, of how clear the Bible is about our salvation and our righteousness being by faith. Over and over again, we see this. It's by faith. It's not of works. It's not the works that you do. It's not the obedience to the law. It's faith. It's faith. It's faith. 
all throughout both of those contexts, and they are both referring to that same passage in Genesis chapter 15 that we started with, where Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But let's look at James chapter 2. Let's start reading in verse number 14. Because this is, this is kind of where we start, where people will, will like to throw this at you. Now, before I was really learned in the Bible, this threw me for a loop. And I had a really difficult time trying to understand this passage. And I get it. It can be difficult to understand. But when you're preaching the gospel, you want to be able to answer people and have a good answer. And just to be able to understand yourself, what is James 2 even talking about? And honestly, it's real simple. The problem why most people, I think, have a big issue with James 2 is because so many people start skewing your mind in a certain direction to think of it a certain way. But when we, when we look at it and compare Scripture with Scripture, we'll see evidently what this is talking about. Let's start reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, that what doth it profit is very important and very key for what the whole rest of this chapter is talking about, saying, what is it profit? What good is it? What good is it, my brethren? What's the profit? What's the result? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, does this say that a person does have faith? Or just says that a man says he has faith? Now, if a man says he has faith, how do you as an individual know that that person has faith? As a human being, the only thing that we can possibly have to know whether or not a person has faith is by the things that they say and the things that they do. That's the evidence that we could see. But see, God is able to see the heart. We can't see through. I can't see through a brother Sebastian's heart and say, is his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ? All I can judge him off of is based off of what he does and what he says. But God can see the heart, right? And that's why in Romans 4 we saw... Um, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. Could Abraham glory before men if he had works? Absolutely. You do all these great works, you can glory before men. He says, but not before God. God knows your heart. God knows um, what's going on. And men might be able to look at these things and you can receive glory of them, but, but not before God because your works do not give you your righteousness in God's eyes. Let's keep reading. And so it says, and now it says, can faith save him? Now, when you're going to determine a doctrine in the Bible that you believe, never base it off of a question, okay? Yeah. There are plenty of clear, undeniable statements made, and we could go on and on and on. You know, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. For by grace are you, you, know, for, for, for by grace are you saved through faith. And he says right here, can faith save him? Now, does it answer that question? Does it, say, does it say faith cannot save a person? Does it say that? No. And it says, though a man says he has faith, but he doesn't have works, can faith save him? It leaves it at that. Okay. Now let's keep reading. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So we saw verse 14, what doth it profit? And we see again in verse 16, what doth it profit? So if someone comes to you, they're naked, they need food, your clothing, and you just say, yeah, you know, be in peace, you know, be warm, be filled, and you don't do anything to help that person, that's of no profit to them at all. You're just, you're just saying empty words that are completely meaningless because you're not helping them at all. Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, I want to pause real quick and go back to verse 17. He says, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now, if a person has faith in Jesus Christ, right, they put their faith in him, but then they don't do any good works, and, or, or they did works and they stopped doing works, is their faith dead? According to the Bible? Yeah, absolutely. But does this say that that person is going to hell? No. Does this say that your faith, if your faith is dead, you're going to hell? No. Absolutely not. It never says that. Is their faith dead? Yes. And, I, and I'll testify to this. There was a point in my life when my faith was dead. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I'll give you my personal testimony real quick. For those of you who haven't heard it, when I was 20 years old, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. 
Now, from that moment forward, you know, there was a short period of time I kind of wanted to learn. I kind of wanted to go to church and stuff like that. But that subsided. You know why? Because I still like doing the things that my flesh liked to do. Did I have a new spirit inside me? Absolutely. I'm born again. But I still like to do some of those old things that my flesh liked to do. And that kind of drew me away and drew me out of church to the point to where I, did, I wasn't doing anything for the Lord at all. Yeah. Did my faith die? You betcha. And it was dead for years. It was dead for a long time. Yeah. It wasn't until I, I started going and got in a good church and actually got baptized. I got baptized many years after I got saved and then started getting right with God where my faith revived. But regard, you know, whether my faith was alive or dead, Jesus Christ still saved my soul the moment I put my faith in Him yeah. and He gave me the free gift of eternal life. And eternal, it means forever. It lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never ends. And if it ever were to end, then God's a liar. But He gave me the gift of eternal life. But... Um, so, yes, it's possible. Now, there's a lot of people that teach. They'll say, well, if you have faith, you automatically are going to be doing the works. But then that would mean that this verse doesn't even make any sense. Because a lot of people like to say, well, you know, if that person really is saved, then there's no way in the world they would ever, you know, be a drunk. Or there's no way in the world they would ever do this. So that just automatically shows there's no way that person could be saved. I don't believe that for a second. Right. Because it's possible for your faith to be dead. Otherwise, this wouldn't make any sense. If you, if you could say, oh, they would never do such a thing. Yes, they would. It's possible because we still have this sinful flesh. Yeah. When you get saved, your spirit's born again. That's the new creature, but we still have this old flesh. And that's why it's a constant battle daily. We struggle against our flesh. The spirit wars against the flesh. And these two are enmity against each other. So you cannot do the things that you would. But let's keep reading. Um, so in verse 18, he says, okay, look, you say you have faith and I have works. He says, um, show me thy faith without thy works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, there's nothing wrong with that statement. That's, that's a great statement because how else are you going to show people your faith? If your faith is dead, if you're not doing any works, no one's going to know that you have faith because that's the way that we see. We, we could only see what comes out through your works. Verse number 19 Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Here's another verse that gets misquoted all the time. People who don't like to say, oh yeah, you easy believe isn't people. You, you know, all you got to do is believe and you're saved. They'll say, well, the devils believe, so are they saved? No, because first of all, what does it say they believe? It says, thou believest that there is one God. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but does believing in one God just make you saved? If you just say, I believe there's one God, does that, is that how a person gets saved? Is that what the Bible says that we have to believe in order to be saved? Because in that case, I think the Muslims believe there's one God, right? They call him Allah. There's plenty of other religions that believe that there's one God. But does that make them saved? No. What does it say the devils believe? They believe that there's one God. That doesn't make them saved. So don't let anyone use this verse against you. Say, oh, well, the devils also believe, so they saved. No. First of all, devils aren't people. It's not humankind. It's a totally different creation. I mean, God also created the beasts of the field. Does that mean that they have to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved either? No. It's a different, I mean, it's a different creation. It's a different creature than, than the devils or angels or us. But um, regardless of that, you know, the devils believe in one God. Fine. But that's not what makes anybody saved. Verse number 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, this event that, that, it's ref that the Bible is referring to in James chapter 2, when he offered up Isaac his son upon the altar, takes place in Genesis chapter 22. This is where we see this story of, of Abraham, you know, um, God calls on Abraham and he says, look, I want you to make a sacrifice. And he goes to sacrifice his son. As he said, I want you to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. So Abraham goes, and God's proving him. He's testing him whether or not he's really going to do this. And Abraham's going. And um, I'll just read for you from Genesis 22 real briefly that story. Verse 16 says, and said, um, well, no, after, so after all of that, I, I don't have this in my notes and I don't want to turn it to take up too much time, but, um, 
you know, God see, God stops him right before he's going he's gonna to kill his son. He says, okay, I see your heart. You're not going to withhold even your own son from me. And he blesses him. And this is the blessing that he gets in verse uh, 16 of Genesis 22. And said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So this is the great blessing that, that Abraham receives after God sees his heart, after he sees he's not he's he's gonna um you know fulfill what what God asked him to do and that he wasn't gonna hold anything back from serving the Lord. Now What's interesting about this is because this is saying, this is how Abraham's justified by works according to James 2, right? When we saw in Galatians uh, 3 and in Romans 4 was the direct quote, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. In James 2, it's referring to Abraham being justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son. Okay, now, obvious, when, when, when Abraham was believed God, was prior to him having any children at all. That was before he even had Ishmael, the son of the, of the bondmaid, right? Because he had Ishmael first, and then he had Isaac even later. So just to put this in perspective, Abraham was 86 years old when, when Ishmael was born. And he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And right there, that's at least 14 years. And, and when Abraham believed God, it was before Ishmael was born. So we've got 14 years just until the birth of Isaac. And when Isaac was going to be offered, he, was, he at least had to be old enough to carry the wood. Now, I believe it was when Isaac was 30 years old, he was a picture of Jesus Christ. But let's just say, I mean, let's just be real conservative here and just say, you know, just for the, the sake of figuring out these numbers, you know, if, even if Isaac was like six years old, just old enough to be able to carry this wood, because it says he, he laid the wood on him to bring to the, uh, to the offering, that's at least 20 years that had to have passed since Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness before he was justified by works. That justification by works came 20 years after the initial promise. And he even had a lapse of faith in between because he had, he, had um, he had Ishmael with, the, with Hagar, with the, the bondmaid. And um, he actually, you know, obviously he must have questioned that promise or questioned how God was going to be able to perform that in order for him to have that lapse of faith and commit that sin. But let's keep reading in James chapter 2 because we see here that's at least 20 years that go by, at least. Minimum. I'm sure, I believe it was a lot more than that, but 20 years go by between Abraham being justified by faith and then his works being justified by his works. And what's important to also know about James 2, look at verse number 22. It says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, verse 24, how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Now, yeah. he's saying, you see, how is a person justified? Well, they're not justified in God's eyes as far as their eternal salvation is concerned. They're, salva they're, they're, they're justified in the sense that they're proving their faith by doing the works. It's the outward manifestation of their faith. That's how they're justified. They're justified in man's eyes. And we see that in James 2, the, the main point of James 2, he's talking about being justified before man. Yeah. We see in Romans chapter 4 and Galatians chapter 3 being justified before God. That's why in Romans 4 it says, you know, Abraham hath world of glory, but not before God. In God's eyes, God can see the heart. God can see through and he knows the thoughts of your heart and of your mind. He knows whether or not you put faith in him, but man doesn't. In order for man to see your faith, he has to see works. He has to see some outward expression. But in James chapter 2, he says, look, now do you understand? Now do you see? He says... That scripture was fulfilled when Abraham offered up his son. Why was it fulfilled? Because God had promised 
that of his seed, he was going you know, to multiply his seed, and he gave him Isaac. And he said, And Isaac shall thy seed be, be blessed. And um, Abraham knew that God was able even to bring him back from the dead. That's, so you say, well, why would Abraham even go to, to offer up his son as a sacrifice? That's kind of crazy. Well, it's not crazy because Abraham had faith in God that he knew that those promises were delivered unto him. And he probably just, he, he believed that God is able to raise him up from the dead. That's what Abraham believed. He knew that God would be able to do it. He wasn't worried about losing his son forever or anything like that. He knew that, and he knew the gospel. He was preached before the gospel. So he probably figured he was just enacting out what was going to happen in the future with Jesus Christ anyways, with Jesus Christ, because that's all symbolic. And we're going to get into that when we get to Genesis chapter 22. There's so much symbolism in that chapter um, regarding Isaac and Jesus Christ being, being that sacrifice made for our sins. And that's going to, I can't wait for that sermon. It's going to be a good one to, to look at all the symbolism. But um, we see that Isaac was the, was the symbolic reference. So Abraham probably thought he's just going to, re he's going to enact this out. But, and, and with the full resurrection and everything else, and, um, and him doing that was fulfilling that he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So um, when we get James to, you know, try not to let it trick you out. There's a lot, there's a lot of things that people like to say, like the devils believe or, um, you know, can a person uh, be saved by faith only without works? Well, yes, they can in God's eyes. Now, is a person going to believe you if you have no works? And this is another thing. When I, when I was back, real backslidden and, and when my faith was dead, there were opportunities that I had to try to share the gospel with people. And the reason why I didn't was because I knew I would just sound like a complete hypocrite. Right. And now I'm not saying that's right, but that's just the way I felt. Uh, you know, I, I don't want people to, you know, I want to have credibility when I speak. So when you're going out and doing everything contrary to the Bible, but then you tell someone, but yeah, I believe the Bible, no one's going to listen to you. Why would they? Why would they believe what you had to say? Now, should I have shared the gospel anyways? Yeah, I should have. Because that's what's right. I should have done it. But I also should have cleaned up my act, which I ended up eventually doing. But um, you know, no one's going to believe you when you're, when you're saying one thing and doing another. You're just being a total hypocrite. And James too, the whole point, James, he's trying to fire up these people and stir them up to do the works. Yeah. He's like, hey man, pure religion undefiled is this, that, we, um, that you visit the fatherless and widows. And um, yeah. I say I'm misquoting that already too. James chapter 1, right? He says, pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James is really pushing for the, for the believers, for the brethren, to do these good works. He's saying, look, if someone comes to you and they're in need and you just tell them, oh yeah, be filled, you just, you're, everything you say sounds great, but you're not actually doing anything, you know, that doesn't profit anybody anything. The same way, you know, you could come to church and you could say all the right words, say, oh yeah, hey brother, and you speak all spiritual and stuff, but you're not actually doing anything for the Lord. What profit is that? It profits nothing. It's vanity. If just if someone thinks, oh, hey, this person's real spiritual, but you're doing nothing for the Lord, that's, that's vanity. It's nothing. It's, it's meaningless. That's why we need to be doing good things because when you're doing the good works, your faith is alive and you're going to have a much bigger impact on other people's lives. You're actually going to be doing something about it instead of just saying it. Um, but let's flip back real quick then to, um, to Genesis chapter 15. So always look up these places because Romans 4 and Galatians 3 both very clearly refer to Abraham putting his faith in God, believing in the Lord, and that's counted to him for righteousness. James 2 refers to a, the, the same story but says that that was completely fulfilled and made perfect when he carried out this act, when he did these works. But the salvation comes through the faith. The, the justification through the works is um, something that's an outward expression of that faith, but that's not the, the, the element of saving your soul. 
right? And that's why he says, you see that how a man is saved. It's because it's not his eternal salvation. It's not what James 2 is talking about. James 2 is never referring to your eternal salvation. That's not what the, the context of, of James 2 is even talking about. Whereas Romans chapter 4 and Galatians 3 clearly are talking about our, our justification before God um, as far as us being sinners and being justified in His sight. But let's, uh, let's keep reading here through Genesis 15. We'll finish up this chapter. Um, verse number 7, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And this is, this is amazing. So we see here, you know, God's talking to Abraham. And, um, you know, Abraham asks for a seat, you know, for a child. And, of course, God blesses him. And then he tells him to, um, to take these animals. And he, and he cuts them, basically cuts them in half. He divides them and lays them out. And the birds try to come down. He chases the birds away. And then as he's doing this, you know, it's getting later in the day. Abraham falls asleep. And it says there's this great, like this horror, this horrible darkness. So it's extremely dark. And um, God prophecy, he basically tells the future on Abraham. He says, okay, this is what's going to happen. You know, your seed, you're going to be taken into captivity. He says for 400 years, you're going to be afflicted. But then you're going to be delivered and you're going to come out. And he says, I'm going to judge that nation and they're going to come out with much substance. So you're going to spoil it. Remember when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt um, they spoiled the Egyptians. Remember, they asked to borrow their, their stuff, their jewelry and all these other things um, to go to serve the Lord. And, of course, they didn't go back and return them. They, they, they spoiled them. They took all their stuff. And, um, and that was God's judgment upon that nation. And that, um, that was their spoil for, for basically defeating them and, and for God defeating them and coming out. And this is all prophesied here to Abraham. Abraham receives his promise and um, in verse 16 it says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So those pieces of the animals that he cut up, he sees this, this smoking furnace, this burning fire. And this is the way God appears unto people many times in the Old Testament. You see, he appeared unto Moses as a burning bush, and um, he was a... Uh, a pillar of cloud by, by the day and a, a pillar of fire by night for the children of Israel when he, when he led them out of Egypt. And um, so Abraham sees this going among the pieces that he, that he cut up in verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he goes on and lists the people, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cabanites. And the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Riphiams and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Now, well, I don't think I'm going to get into that tonight. It's not enough scripture here and I don't have all my notes. But um, so we see here God's laying out the land that he's given him, the promised land. Right? When he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, he says, okay, I want you to go in this land. This is the promised land I've given to you. And he delineates here exactly what he's going to inherit. But he tells them, he says, look, you're gonna, you know, your children, your seed, they're going to go into captivity. They're going to be taken away for a while by another nation. And then they're going to come back with much substance. And they're going to come back when, it says, when the iniquity of the, Am when the Amorites is full. He says, it's not yet full. It's not ready yet. God's divine... Um, timing of everything is, is amazing because not only was he giving, you know, fulfilling Abraham's promise just to bless him and to give him a land, he also at the same time was bringing judgment upon a wicked heathen people 
that rejected God, that were doing all kinds of horrible things. We saw in the book of Leviticus, it says when he's giving the law, and especially when he's going through all the, like in, in chapter 20, chapters 18 and 20, he's saying, look, all the people of the land, he says, they did all of these things. And it starts, you know, Leviticus lays out some pretty disturbing acts that people can do. You know, the mankind lying with mankind and lying with beasts and all these other things and all these other sins that are going on. He says, all the people of the land do these things. He says, uh, you know, I'm telling you so you're not like them so the land doesn't spew you out. And um, when God brought in the children of Israel after the, after the 400 years in Egypt, when he brought them into the promised land, you know, you often wonder why, you know, why did God have them kill everybody and everything and just wipe everything out? People have a hard time understanding that. You know, even the women and the children and everything. It's because it's God's judgment was being passed upon an extremely wicked society. God's judgment always comes down on wicked people and, you know, wicked nations. Now, you might say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair for the children. But see, when you sin, it always affects other people. And it's not God's fault. It's your own fault for doing those things. But I often bring up this example. You think about someone who, you know, maybe is an alcoholic and that beats their wife or beats their children. Is it the children's fault that dad's an alcoholic and that, and that, he's, that he's doing these horrible things to him? No. But are they still suffering as a result of his sin? You betcha. They are. There, there are consequences that happen where, where people get caught up in the middle. Well, you know, the, the children in that land, unfortunately, they suffered a consequence that they didn't bring on themselves, but their parents did. All the people in the land, when they were doing all those wicked abominations, they had to be judged. And God says, look, they need to be, this needs to be just wiped out and dealt with. This is God's judgment upon that nation. When you, you know, God's long suffering. God's merciful. And God gave these people a lot of time to get right with them. And they could have repented. They could have, they could have gotten right with God. But they didn't. They got worse and worse and worse. And you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to go into that story too through the book of Genesis. But, um, you know, God destroyed that entire city. He rained fire and brimstone down upon it because they had gotten so wicked and so far away from God. Um, but that's, that's, you know, why, why that happened. Um, it might seem extreme to you, but, but you don't really know and see what's been going on in that city from day, day in and day out. And I can't imagine what's going to be coming out in our country when we have the, the abortions, you know, all these murders. The abortion is murder. And there's, I mean, that happens by the millions every year of just innocent blood being shed. Yeah. And it's easy for us in our own lives to not think about that. You know, you might think, oh, we're not that bad. Everything's going great. But you know what? God sees every single innocent soul that's cut short when that blood is shed. God knows about it. And you better believe that makes God angry. He doesn't like all of his creation and these people, th these are people he's forming and fashioning in the womb. God forms and fashions each one of us individually. He puts his thoughts and his time and his efforts into you specifically. He counts the number of the hairs on your head. He knows them. He's forming and fashioning children inside of wombs that people are going in and cutting them out and destroying that life and just, and just spitting on God's creation. Yeah. And they don't even think there's anything wrong with it. And shedding innocent blood. God knows, God hears their cry of that blood, of their shed blood. And that judgment's going to come. And that's just one thing. That is one thing, let alone the adultery and the fornication and the wickedness and the lasciviousness and the thefts and, and, and the oppression of the poor and everything else that's going on in this country and around the world, but specifically in our country, all the wickedness that's abounding you better believe God's judgment's going to come. All the more reason why we need to make sure that we're doing what's right. Hey, even in the midst of, of, of a crooked and perverse nation, God can protect His people. God can make sure that, that if you're doing what's right, you know, that, that maybe you won't be that collateral damage. But, um, but God can look out and protect us. But this is, God makes His covenant with Abram, and He says, look, I've given this land to your seed. And he gives them the, the boundaries. And um, that's where we end off in chapter 15. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please just help us to, um, 
to study your words, especially when, when we come to, to points of Scripture that we might not understand. And God, help us also when there's, when there's one section of the Bible or one passage, maybe that seems, that sounds kind of difficult, or where, you know, especially in James 2, we see, well, can faith save them? Is, is that really saying that we can't, that we need works? When we could read the Bible and have a mountain of evidence that says one thing, and then we have one verse that is kind of unclear that, that does it, is it saying, is it contradicting? Lord, help us to understand that we just may not understand that verse, but it's not, you know, none, nothing in your word is contradictory. You don't contradict yourself. And if there's something that seems like a contradiction, maybe we just don't fully understand what it is. So help us to identify those things and not let it shake our faith, but that we would build our doctrine off of all the solid statements that you give us in the Bible. And that um, we can study to show ourselves approved that when we see these statements and we see these references to the Old Testament that we go and look them up and really try to analyze and figure out what everything's talking about, dear God. And we love you and we thank you so much for your precious gift of eternal life to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.